Well, we're going we're gonna to transition now and continue to talk about matters of frugality and particularly in investing. And uh, we've asked uh, Colton Neifert to come up and share some things. Uh, you know, I've had a chance to watch Colton for many years. It was over a half a dozen years ago. Colton showed up here as an intern. And um, it didn't take me long to figure out that this was Mr. Frugality. And they should have named him Frugality. Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, he, uh, when he was an intern for the seven months he was here, uh, lived on, and I'm not kidding, $1.35 a day for food. How about that? Well, was it food? What was it? I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> Could it have been food? I don't know what it was. But when I went up and saw it, it didn't look like food to me. But he lived on it, and he was very disciplined. Anyway, Colton, would you come up and share with us? Good evening. So I couldn't afford to put $100,000 in my slides, and I don't have a laser pointer. So if you fall asleep, that's OK. <laughs> so I'm talking about frugality and investing. So I'm going to quickly go over the what, the why, and then go through some practical tips for uh, applying these things. So first off, frugality. Um, a lot of times when you think of frugality, you think of um, you know, getting by as cheap as possible and spending the least amount uh, that you can on things. But really, frugality is financial prudence. So it's, it's managing your money wisely. And why should you do that? Um, it's pretty clear throughout Scripture. I think a lot of these guys have nailed it already. You know, we need to be good stewards of the things that we're given. So let me jump right into some practical tips that I've used over the years, especially during the internship. So um, my first tip is to learn to quickly convert money to time and vice versa. So this helps you kind of uh, place a value on, you know, what it is you're about to buy so you can, you can gauge whether or not it's worth it. Um, a quick example of this is, so say you want to go buy, you know, the new iPhone SE, it's 400 bucks, you make $25 an hour, you can quickly say, okay, 400 divided by 25, it's 16 hours, so two days of work, is it worth me going to work for two days to acquire this phone? You know, you can be the judge of that. The inverse of that is, you know, converting time back to money. So um, one example of this is, uh, we just moved, and uh, there's an office in the house that we moved into, and I wanted to build a desk for that office. Uh, you know, if I was going to have the desk built, it would probably cost $1,000. Um, parts would be about $250. Uh, and I estimated 10 hours for me to build it myself. So, you know, cost minus parts is $750 divided by $10 an hour. It's $75 an hour that I'm saving or paying myself, however you want to look at that. Um, so then you can kind of qualify, is it worth it for me to go ahead and build it myself for $75 an hour? Or, you know, should I just pay somebody to do it? You know, do I, do I have the time or not? So these examples don't take everything into account. That's just a quick, rough way to look at it. But you need to consider the money that you're saving, doing something yourself, it is not equal to money that you would earn. Because money that you earn, you're going to have to pay taxes on, you have to tithe. So there's going to be a good chunk coming out of that. Whereas money that you save, you get to save all of it. So $75 an hour that I would earn, you know, doing a job somewhere is worth less than $75 an hour that I'm saving. Um, same thing with the, the example of the iPhone, you know, go back and look at it, uh, but, but boil it down to your net income, not not the $25 an hour that you make on paper, but um, when you calculate based on net income, you can see that it, it, you know, it may or may not be worth it. It gives you a better picture of how much you actually make per hour. So here's another example um, to look at. So <clears throat> this is more of a during the internship example, OK? So let's say you make 15 bucks an hour. Um, once you subtract you know, your taxes from that, your tithing, uh, you get rid of um, you, your monthly costs like uh, gas and food, um, your phone bill, insurance, etc. Uh, the way I figure it, you know, you, you, you end up probably saving, you know, if you don't have any other expenses, you end up saving about $1,100 a month. So when you take your savings 
um, divided by 160, you know, if you're working 40 hour weeks, um, that $1,100 boils down to $7 an hour, you know, max is what you can be saving. So if you're going to go get your, get ice cream with your friends and you look at, you know, you can get a dipped cone for a dollar or you can get a blizzard for $5, that $4 difference initially might seem very minimal, but when you think about working another 30, 30 minutes just to get that slight upgrade, you know, you th the amount of satisfaction that you get from a dipped cone versus a blizzard, is it worth, you know, paying five times the amount? Um, so the next thing, Mr. Burke already touched on this, but, uh, you know, trim your recurring expenses. You know, these things eat away at you really quickly and you don't realize because they, they seem so small at first. Um, you know, something I do a lot is when I get into some kind of a monthly commitment, I immediately think, you know, how much is this going to cost me over a year or over 10 years, et cetera. You know, you can kind of learn to value it that way. Um, so 15 bucks a month is 180 a year, 50 a month is 600 a year. Um, and then especially, you know, look at the benefit that you're getting from this recurring cost, you know, especially things like Hulu or Netflix, you know, those things are, what, 15 bucks a month. So it's $180 a year, but especially as young men, you know, you have a lot of free time. It's better to put that free time uh, into doing profitable things you know, so here you're spending money on Netflix or whatever. You're spending money to be less productive and make yourself less valuable. So here's another uh, example. So you can, look at, you can look at recurring costs and subscriptions and things like that, but there are also um, things you do habitually, which are uh, kind of the equivalent of a recurring cost. So one example here is going to McDonald's or whatever fast food joint. So if you, if you habitually go out to eat for lunch three times a week, it's easy to just pull up and go, okay, I want you know, my chicken McNugget meal, it's $8, you know, do it and don't think about it. But if, you, if, you just, um, if you're satisfied with a little bit less, you, know, you can easily trim that $8 down into $3, you know, get get two hamburgers and a Coke versus getting the chicken nugget meal. And you end up saving $780 a year just by making that one little change. And it's not something, I think, if you, if you look at it after the fact, after you've enjoyed your meal or whatever, how often do you go and you get a hamburger and you eat a hamburger and you say, man, I wish I had spent the money and got a steak. You know, at that point you're satisfied. So it's, you're spending a, a good bit extra just for little pleasures that don't really matter. Um, another thing Mr. Burke already talked about was uh, insurance. Insurance favors the insurer. They're not gonna sell you the insurance if they're not making money on it. Um, so one thing to do is calculate the max Calculate what you're, what you're insuring in your max loss. So liability insurance obviously is a good idea because you could you know, hit somebody who's driving a Porsche and you know, have a $200,000 bill. But you know, for me, especially you know, before I was married, I never drove a car that was worth more than $2,500. So to pay for full coverage on that car, a lot of times insurance seems like you know, a really prudent thing to do, a really smart thing to do. But to pay for full coverage on that car was going to be an extra 50 bucks a month. So 50 bucks a month is another 600 bucks a year. Oh, sorry. No, it's another 60 bucks a year. Wait. 600. Thank you. <laughs> it's another $600 a year. So if I totaled that car every five years and didn't insure it, I would still be saving $100 a year. So it's just good to think those things through. Sometimes it's easy to just pull the trigger and say, yeah, yeah, it's smart to, you know, get the insurance. But So those are just a couple of, of things you can look at. You know, food, insurance, there's, uh, you know, a hundred other examples um, where you can just kind of examine your monthly costs and your habits and, and trim that out and uh, be saving more. The next point is that money has the same value irrespective of the effort exerted to obtain it. So basically... You know, if you make minimum wage and, you know, you have to work X hours to save $1,000, you know, that $1,000 is worth a lot more to you than 
you know, you would, you, your boss gives you a $10,000 bonus or you make a bunch of money in the stock market or whatever, you know, and you get that $10,000 immediately, it's much less valuable in your mind, you know, but if you go back and you calculate what would this, under normal circumstances, you know, what amount of work would I have to put forth to get this, uh, it makes you much less likely to quickly go blow that money on things that you don't need. So, right, so once you get that money, you know, evaluate what are some things you could do. You could save it towards retirement, you could, you know, put it uh, down towards your house, or you could invest it. And so that brings me to my next topic, which is investing. What is investing? It's, it's spending with the expectation of a return. So it's not even necessarily money. So like tonight, everybody who's been giving these talks, they put time into uh, you know, preparing these talks and to give these talks. And it's with the expectation that you know, the people who are hearing these things, um, it will be more beneficial for them you know, than the time that they put into it. So it will yield a return. Um, why should we be investing? I think uh, Luke 19 is a great example um, where you have the nobleman who gives uh, money to, the, to all his different uh, servants and you know, one earns uh, 10 minus for the one minor, the other earns five, uh, and the other says, hey, you know, I, I just kept this thing for you and here it is back. You know, obviously that's not what was expected from him. He was expecting them to go. He said, go and do business till I come. He was expecting a return. So I think it's a biblical practice. Obviously, I know the point of that proverb or parable is not uh, investing money. But so uh, practical tips on investing. I'm no expert in the stock market, but what has worked well for me um, is understanding understanding the risks. You know, don't don't invest what you can't afford to lose. Um, the fact that you're battling inflation and your money's sitting in a savings account right now is probably, you know, it's, it's earning very, very little. Um, so you want to put that money to work for you, like some of these other men have said. Um, when I Googled, I saw an average return of 7% on the market, but, you know, anything is, is better than what you're going to get in a savings account. So, yeah, you know, invest money that you're not going to need immediately because it may, you know, you, you invest and it may be right before a dip. And you need to be able to ride out that dip. You don't just immediately sell. Um, it's not a good practice. But I would say pick a product that you use and you love. If you find something that, you know, just wows you and you're, you find yourself telling other people about it and you can't believe that, you know, you're the only person using this, that's probably a good thing to invest in. Um, I, you know, invest in things you understand, otherwise you're going to be just playing more of the, the game of, you know, playing the market. So my, my experience is that any time I have tried to play around with the market and be pulling my money in and out and, you know, investing in different things, doing these quick in and out investments, it's, it's never worked out well. I would say just pick something and invest in it and write out that investment long term. And definitely pray because God is sovereign and, you know, that definitely plays a big role in it, I would say. So I've got some closing thoughts. I don't know how I'm on time. I probably went a little fast. I think I've been talking fast. Um, so, so here's just some things, you know, as I've been reading through Proverbs that I've written down, you know, in preparation for this talk. Uh, intend to leave an inheritance for your children. Um, don't just crunch the numbers. Seek God's favor. You know, you see that. Let me pull up some of these verses here. Um, you know, he who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. You know, don't just do the most expedient thing. Be seeking God's favor. Um, this, was, this was another one that I had to come to grips with during the internship, and especially after saving for marriage, was don't worry. I remember being so intent on saving X amount of dollars every month and you know, criticizing every, every little expense. And I remember wanting Chick-fil-A one night and being like, no, it's, it's going to be $6. I can't do it. And then just realizing we've been memorizing Proverbs, or Matthew 6, where Jesus says, you know, don't worry about the money. 
fo focus on uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You don't need to worry about those little things. If it's going to be more expedient for you to go to Chick-fil-A and, you know, be, be studying the word, yeah, you can do it every once in a while. Don't, don't freak out about it. Um, let's see. So I have wealth comes from God. Um, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Uh, don't overwork to be rich. I think that's a direct quote. Because of your understanding, cease. And that's another thing, you know, when you're, when you're considering time and money and, you know, valuing the money as time and being able to see that relationship, especially, you know, when you're a young man and you're saving for marriage, it's, it's, it's easy to, you know, use your extra time and your overtime to try and you know, be making more money, but then especially as you get married and you have kids, and that, that time becomes a lot more valuable to you, so it's good to try and get yourself in a position where that time is also going to be more valuable to your employer, because you don't want to work, you don't want to spend your, your free time working for $15 an hour, because you would much rather, you would definitely spend $15 to have an extra hour with your kids. So... I mean, what's the point of all this? What's the point of, of earning money? Um, use your money for good. Proverbs 11, 24, 25. There's one who scatters yet increases more, and there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads, leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. So it's just like the widow's might. You don't have to, you know, don't, don't set your goals and say, once I have $100,000 in the bank account, then I'm going to help whoever is in need. Um, you know, be, be practicing it already. You know, it's like what we said uh, in, in Luke uh, 19. You know, if you're, if you're a good steward, if you're, uh, if you're faithful with little, you'll be, you'll be given more. Um, Things don't satisfy, right? Like I said about, you know, the hamburger and the steak. You, you eat the hamburger, you eat the steak, it doesn't really matter in the end. You know, you're, you can save up and, and be working for that car or that house or whatever, and once you get it a month later, it doesn't phase you. You know, you're not still elated with that thing that you bought. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. So don't, don't put your trust in what you can squeeze out of the time that you have. So this is, this, is the, this is the whole key right here. This is the whole thing. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. I think that sums up everything. So... There you have it.